Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh Alhamdulillahi rabbil alamin Wassalatu wassalamu ala ashrafil anbiya wal mursalin Wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in uh, I would again uh, thank our brother Dr. Shamim Mia For welcoming here today And indeed this is a very um, in a sense interesting uh, uh, arrangement where the, there are many talks that are given by scholars who have written books and we even have uh, books being sold outside and I, I really hope that this model of encouraging the reading and discussion of books can be also replicated in Southeast Asia where I'm from. Uh, just a bit of background, uh, whenever I walk uh, in the UK, especially when I first came to London, uh, and I was looking for a place to stay. Uh, one brother, one Bangladeshi brother was telling me that, you know, you can stay in my place. And it was a council housing. And I was asking him, coming from Singapore, um, I, I can't be renting this place because, you know, you can't rent out uh, a room from council housing. And he was telling me, you shouldn't be too worried because you look like our cousins. So I just want to start, I'll begin by saying that I... Uh, in a sense, represent what Southeast Asian Islam is all about. And if you have never been to Southeast Asia, to Indonesia, to Malaysia, to Singapore, or to South Thailand, uh, we are actually a multicultural society. My, father's, uh, my father is from Yemen, from Hadramaut, and my mother is Indian. So maybe that's why the Bangladeshis and the Pakistanis tend to identify with me. What I'm going to talk about is basically this whole... Um, in a sense, confluence of ideas and cultures that you see in Southeast Asia. And what I have done in this book is to try and capture the richness of Islamic thought in Southeast Asia that has somehow escaped the attention of Muslims everywhere in the world. So I, I, I'm, I'm going to talk about what I call in the book as the Islamic reformist mosaic in Southeast Asia. If, if you have no grounding at all in academic lingo, and to be frank, I don't like uh, academic house high sounding words. Uh, please do not be worried. I'm going to ground everything that I'm going to say at a level that is um, understandable to everyone. Uh, Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam once said, "Khatib nas ala qadri uqulihim." Speak in the manner to which that is easy to understand, that is understandable to the people and this is what I'm going to do today. So I'm going to begin by talking about um, the whole Southeast Asian Islam in global history, why we have not paid attention to Southeast Asian Islam, and why Southeast Asian Islam is somehow out of our imagination. And then we're going to talk about how the ways in which we think about Islamic thought has to be rethought. And this has to do with the problems of categorization. A lot of the categories that we have used, the concepts, the terms that we have used to describe Muslims not Islam, has become very problematic because of the influence of Orientalism and things like that. And then I'm going to share with you what I mean by the Islamic reformist mosaic. And then the last part will be about the seven strands of thought. I'm not going to talk about it very much. Uh, if you are interested to know more about Southeast Asian thinkers who have influenced Islam in Southeast Asia, please uh, buy a copy of the book and you get to know more about it. So I want to begin uh, by talking about um, the Southeast Asian Islam in global history. Now, if you look at the map of Islam as a whole, a lot of attention has been given by the media to look at developments in Iran, in the Arab world, in Turkey. Uh, but if we look at the whole of the Muslim world, the majority of Muslims in the Muslim world actually do not reside in the Middle East. They are actually in Asia, one of the largest Muslim populations in the world is in Pakistan, second of which is in India. And of course, Southeast Asia alone has more than 350 million Muslims. Now, this map alone tells us that we have a problem of disproportionality. The ways in which we have imagined Islam is an Arabic Islam. It's a Turkish Islam, partly because of these movies that have come out, Urtu Gurul and all this kind of stuff. Uh, and we need to decenter how we imagine Islam. Now, this is not saying that we shouldn't be looking at the Arabic origins of Islam. Islam will always be, in a sense, identified with the Arabic language. 
because the Quran itself says that inna Quranan uh, uh, Quranan Arabiya, right? That the Quran is revealed in the Arabic language. To say that Islam originated in the Arabic language doesn't mean that we will or we should only look at the Arabs as the source of inspiration for Islam. And this is where what I'm trying to do is to get Muslims all over the world, not only in Southeast Asia, but in South Asia, in Africa, and especially in the West, to now look at ideas that are coming out elsewhere in the Muslim world. Because as we expand our horizon to look at the entire Muslim world, we can actually benefit more from our brothers and sisters who have given us many books, many writings, many pronouncements, even fatwas, that can be beneficial for the rest of the world. So again, for anyone who's of Arab origins here, which includes myself, I'm Arab and Indian, so it's both. Please do not be offended because I'm not saying that we throw away the Arabs and start looking at Southeast Asians, but rather that we need to now look at the Ummah as a whole and to look at the Ummah who are or who have always been seen as the fringe of the Muslim world to be at the center again. And of course, uh, some Orientalists, and this is an American scholar, has mentioned this too. They talk about the Arabistic bias that promulgates a unidirectional view of Islamic history. To put it very simply, that at the end of the day, our view of Islam is very much determined by what Arabs do. Hence, when there's Arab spring, it becomes a big issue for the entire Muslim world. But when there's something happening in some part of West Africa, nobody gives any attention to it. So this is the problem that we have. And there are a lot of books uh, that you can look at to look at Southeast Asia. This is a book by Anthony Milner called The Malays, if you want to understand uh, one ethnic, big ethnic group in Southeast Asia that are Muslims, generally Muslims are the Malays. And of course, Islamic civilization and the modern world. I don't know whether we have those, those books outside, but these are the books that we, uh, we need to look at. Now, I want to move very quickly then, first, we need to correct our whole idea of what the Ummah is and how we view the entire Muslim world. Now, I want to move into how we think about Islam. Now, there is a problem right now in how we imagine Islam. And this problem has to do much with media sensationalization of Islam. That whenever we talk about Islam, we talk in, at the level of dichotomies and binaries. Or to put it in very simple terms, we always see things as either ors. Either you are a Salafi or you are a Sufi. Either you are Ikhwani or you are Jamaati. Either you are good Muslim or bad Muslim. And this is a product of the kind of literature that has been produced about Islam where we are divided into modern versus traditional. If you wear a suit, you are modern. And someone who wears a suit cannot talk about Islam in a very normative way. But someone who wears a sorban or a thawb or things like that, they are expected to be more traditional. And there's also the division between the progressive and the conservative. Anyone who supports certain movements that say that Islam needs to be reinterpreted in such a way that salah is no longer important is progressive. And someone who says that, oh, we need to be attentive to issues of sexuality and things like that, they will be seen as conservative. And of course, pacifists and radical fundamentalists and secularists. If you read a lot of the literature that has been produced about Islam today, this is how we have been categorized. We have seen ourselves in boxes or placed ourselves into boxes. And this does not represent what Muslims are. We may be soft on certain issues and hard on others. We may be so-called fundamentalists when it comes to uh, things like protecting the integrity of the family, but we may be very open-ended when it comes to accepting people from other cultures in society. And sometimes people from the outside studying Muslims cannot see why is it that Muslims can be so cosmopolitan, but at the same time, they are equally strong in their values, in their principles, in their beliefs. So we need to move away from looking at Islam in boxes. And of course, there are a lot of literature on this. I'm not going to go in deeply into, into this. There's a young girl here, and I want to make sure that she can understand what, what I'm saying today. So if you don't understand everything that uncle is saying today, at least you're going to go back knowing that you need not see Muslims as uh, being in boxes. And there is a great scholar by the name of uh, Jacques Wardenberg in his book, Muslim as Actors, he said that many of these terms that we have been using about Islam, 
they do not render any service to a serious study of the variety of social radiation and interaction or to any understanding of interests, motivations, and intentions guiding the adherence of Islam. So, if there's one thing that I would like everyone here to remember, we need to move away from many of these terminologies that have been used to describe us, especially the, 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 the term Islamist, which is very, very highly problematic, but now has been used by many scholars working on so-called political Islam to describe people who are intent on setting up what they call, so-called, the Islamic State. So what I'm trying to do with this book is to offer now a new way at looking at the Muslim world, especially Muslim societies in Southeast Asia, that would more accurately uh, describe what they are. And I call it the Islamic reformist mosaic. Now, I need to explain uh, what I mean by the Islamic reformist mosaic. Of course, it is a new terminology in itself. It is a terminology that I conceptualize not from my own imagination of what Islam is, and this is the problem of many works on Islam today, but rather with my own interaction with people in Southeast Asia and elsewhere. I was educated here in the UK, and of course, as I said just now, I'm born in Southeast Asia from different cultures, and these cultures tell me that we are all a confluence of many identities, many ways of thinking, and we exist as mosaics in our own society. So what the book does, uh, this book was originally actually published by Oxford University Press, and the relations are kind enough because Oxford University Press sell it at 80 quid, and it's just too much uh, for, for a general audience. So it's republished in paperback uh, by a Malaysian publisher. And in the book, I mentioned that the Muslim reformers that I discuss in this book are actually microcosms and mirrors of their counterparts elsewhere, although their historical and political experiences have given them some unique characteristics. So when you look at a lot of these thinkers, they are actually no different from all of the other thinkers in different parts of the Muslim world. What differentiates them from other parts of the Muslim world are their experiences. So many of us in the societies that we are living in, we are affected by the ways in which we interact in our own societies. And just to give a simple example, yes, I'm living right now in the house of one of the brothers here uh, in, in the UK, in Manchester. And in Southeast Asia, before we enter into anyone's house, the first thing we would do is open up our shoes and put our shoes outside. But here in, in, in the West, people would go into the house with their shoes. Right? And this is just one example of the difference in culture. And it's not about this one is right or that one is wrong, but rather that our culture would affect the ways in which we imagine or we live Islam. Right? As we say uh, in Usul Fiqh, al-adatu muhakkama, that adat or culture is a, is a source of law. So I use the term the Islamic reformist mosaic. When I use the term the Islamic Islamic reformists, I am referring to a long and unbroken line of Fakan scholarship that derives its inspiration from two foundational sources, the Quran and the Sunnah, with a primary intent of reforming Islam and renewing Tajdid, the Islamic way of life. So when I use the word Islamic reformists, and here I pick up an argument against many of these liberal scholars who are saying that you can be Muslim without having to believe in the hadith, or you can be Muslim without even having to refer to the Quran, I'm arguing in this book that you cannot claim any form of Islamicity without going back to the Quran and the Sunnah. And you cannot claim to be an Islamic reformist when you push away the Quran and the Sunnah as the foundational source of any project of reform. Because all project of, projects of reforms in Islam begins first with text and its interaction with context. I'll repeat this. Whenever we want to re reform ourselves, whenever we want to reform our societies, we must always see the dialectical or the interaction between text and context in any situation. Not only about reforming the whole of society, in fact ourselves. Allah wa Rasul wa ulil amri minkum. When even the Quran, Allah uh, reminds us, go back to Allah and the Rasul. How do you go back to the to Allah and the Rasul? 
You go back up to Allah and Rasul through the Quran and the Hadith. What will amri minkum? The context, the people who have, uh, who are in charge of you. So the interaction between text and context uh, tells us what it means to be an Islamic reformist. And when I use the word Islamic reformist, I'm talking about the dialogical part of it. That at the end of the day, when we talk about reforming ourselves, reforming our societies, we cannot start with assumptions that do not truly reflect the anxieties of the people on the ground. That dialogical means it is a style of thought that retains commonly held ideas about Islam as both a belief system and a lived reality. This necessitates a dynamic interaction between text and context to offer innovative solutions to problems confronting society. And the same applies when we want to reform our own family. You cannot, I mean, I have six kids myself from ages 23 to eight years old. I don't think anybody in this room has six children. So I beat all of you on this call, at least other than writing books. But my point being that even as we are trying or attempting to reform our families, we must go back to the text and at the same time understand our context. Because the young people today, we were just talking about it just now, they cannot even follow you in a discussion that goes beyond 15 minutes. Am I correct? <laughs> After 15 minutes, they are not listening to you. They are in Instagram, they are in Facebook, they are taking pictures. That's the situation on the ground right now. But that doesn't mean that they are in a worse situation than we were before. Because as older people, we always say, oh, times were very good then. It's much worse now. It's not true. Because the Quran reminds us, the Hadith of Rasulullah he reminds us that we need to speak to the people of your generation in the level that is understandable to them. Right? So that's the first, the Islamic reformists. Why do I use the word mosaic? Uh, I use the word mosaic because I understand Islam as it is expressed in society, as Islam that is colorful. That yes, there's one Islam, but Muslims have different ideas. And these differences in ideas are the thing that binds us together. And this is where there is a hadith of Rasulullah who says that the differences in my ummah is actually a form of rahmah. It's actually a good thing. Scholars have debated whether the hadith is sahih, da'if, hassan, whatever. I'm not going to get into it. But at least the gist of the hadith is saying that as Muslims, we manifest, we think, and we, we live Islam in different ways. And that differences doesn't make us disunited. These differences are the thing that brings us together. Each strand of thinking drew on the ideas of another, forming a coherent and united frame of thought. So I use the word the Islamic reformist mosaic to capture the ideas of seven key thinkers. I will not go through them, uh, all of them, and I have two more minutes, so I'm going to end on time. Uh, the first person is Said Naqib al who talks about secularism, how secularism has affected Muslim societies. And his key idea is to de-secularize societies, to make people understand that they cannot live life in dualism, that when they go to work, they become less Islamic. When they come back from work, suddenly they become Muslim again. When they talk to the non-Muslim friends, they behave as if that they are non-Muslims. And when they go back to their Muslim circle, suddenly they become Islamic again. So he talks about this. He talks about how secularism has divided our thinking to become dichotomized to become dualized. So that's the first thinker. The second is Harun Nasution, who emphasized on the importance of the aql, of reason. Why we need to use reason in handling any problems in society. Because Muslims in Southeast Asia during his time were saying that we need to stop reasoning about Islam. Rather, we should just leave it. Because when you question too much, you become like the devil. And this is actually a devilish idea. It's not true that when you question things in society, you are actually going out of Islam. So that's the second thinker. The third thinker is Osman Bakar, the epistemologist. He talks about the issues of knowledge in Muslim societies, where there is a hierarchy that Muslims have conceptualized when it comes to knowledge and learning. When it comes to learning the Quran, and you see it in Muslim societies, we don't want to pay Quranic teachers as much. But when it comes to sending our kids to universities, we can spend thousands and thousands of dollars. The Ustads of the Quran deserves only $50 an hour. 
But Michael Porter, who's giving a lecture on management, he deserves 10,000 per hour. So this, this um, differentiation between knowledge is the thing that um, Osman Bakar was concerned about. And he talks about the unity of knowledge, the bringing together of sacred knowledge and so-called secular knowledge. The fourth thinker is Ahmad Ibrahim, who talks about the Sharia. And I talked about this in, in the book, in chapter 4, about how the Sharia has become a kind of scary word, especially in the West. This whole idea of the creeping Sharia. And Ahmad Ibrahim argues that the, the word Sharia ought not to be something that is a, a scapegoat for uh, blaming Muslims for being radical. Rather, Sharia need to be rethought and re-explained in such a way that non-Muslims would be uh, interested and would consider as part and parcel of their laws. Kunto Wijoyo, historicists, talk about the importance of history in the understanding of what needs to be reformed. He talks about how Muslims generally are blind about their own past. In fact, if you ask most Muslims whether they know about Islamic history, many of them are not interested. I'm trained as a historian of Islam. I remember back in the days in 2005, when I was doing my uh, breaking of fast in the London mosque, and one brother, Pakistani brother, was asking me, so what are you doing here, brother? I said, I'm doing a PhD. In what field? In history. How are you going to eat? He asked me. Why don't you do engineering, finance, and this kind of stuff? And I was saying, well, I like history, so that's why I'm doing history. But again, there is this uh, shunning of our own past. And this is a big problem, especially when we look at the young generation. They are living in the present. I'm going to give these talks in London on Saturday and Sunday. How the problem of presentism, living in the now, is a big problem in our society. And Kunto Wijoyo talks about this. We need to go back to the past in order for us to understand how we got here and how we move into the future. Uh, Cesar Adib Mahul from the Philippines talk about the issues of integration especially when it comes to Muslims and as minorities, because he was a Filipino Muslim living in a majority Catholic nation. How do minorities, how do Muslim minorities uh, negotiate their space within a, a non-Muslim context? And how do we actually tell people about our religion without sounding threatening? So he tried to reform how Muslims view their own religion and their place. And last but not least is this lady called Zakia Darajat, who talks about the importance of morality. Now, she was the first Indonesian Muslim who took a PhD in psychology in Ain Shams University in Egypt, a remarkable woman who could speak French, uh, who could also read German, and at the same time who studied psychology. And she was talking about the breakdown of morality in Muslim society so far ahead in her time. You can see the breakdown right now. Uh, in Southeast Asia, I'm not sure how is it like here in England, one every three marriages would end up in divorce within the first five years. Some say two. I'm now staying in Kuala Lumpur, one every two marriages would end up in divorce within the first five years of marriage or after 20 years of marriage. So either you get divorced quickly or you get a divorce when you're older. And she talks about the importance of regaining, recovering, the morality in Islam, why we need to restate uh, the importance of morality in Islam. So I'm just going to end here uh, because I think that is uh, enough as an overview of what the book is all about. What I want to emphasize here is that we need to rethink how we look at Islam outside the Middle East. We need to pay more attention to other manifestations and thinking about Islam, especially in Southeast Asia, in South Asia, in Africa, and other parts of the Muslim world. And in that way, we would enrich the manner to which Islamic scholars have tried to reform their societies for us to reform our homes, our families, and our own societies. Thank you very much.